Let's talk about why this is probably one of the best um, prescriptions, I would say, in terms of exercise. Are you going to say probably? Most or people. I, I think you could say it is, right? Well, here's why I'll say sometimes yeah, it point. isn't. Like the form of exercise you're going to do is always going to be the best okay. versus the ones you're not okay. going to do. So if you just hate it like so much, if you just are super passionate about another form of exercise and you know you'll be consistent, well, the one you do is always going to be better than the one you don't do. So that being said, if you're not necessarily partial and if you're doing this mainly for the results and the benefits that you're going to get from it, then I think uh, we can make a very compelling data-driven and experience-driven case for why strength training is just so you, superior. You know, even though I agree with you with that statement, there there is a part of that, and I, we say it, I know we say it, you know, the, uh, about consistency and it's important that yeah. you want to do it. The only reason why I don't like that message is because there's a lot of people, and including myself at one point in my life, that are addicted to training a certain way for the wrong reasons. And so they they may be consistent with it, but then it it technically is not necessarily the healthiest thing. It's not benefiting them for, right. for that long. Right. Like the, 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 let's say like the the runner, right? Like the the marathon runner who's like a, addicted to the the dopamine hits from the long runs and needs to have a competition in order to exercise and so they've justified these like constantly yeah. race after race after race and if they're they're either uh, racing, they're they're eating better and they're exercising like crazy. If they're not, then they're way off the other direction. Yeah. How about somebody who's like the bodybuilder guy or girl who's massively insecure about the way they look, and so pouring themselves into competitions drives them to be consistent with their working out because they're insecure about yeah. their bodies. So, I you know I caution that that statement sometimes, even though it is true that 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 you know the consistency of you working out is important and we've said before that a you know inferior program done consistently is better than a superior program done inconsistently but also you need a little bit of self-awareness yeah. around what what's the driving mechanism of why you gravitate towards that way of training i no? definitely prefer that people move and i'm glad that that's like a first step you know if it's something you enjoy and it's going to get you up and about and moving your body uh, but what's going to benefit you the longest? And I think that um, it needs to be promoted so that way it's at least a thought for them that uh, if I get into resistance training, this is something that's going to benefit my body the longest out of any other activity that I'm going to be a part of, just so they know that. Strength training doesn't burn a lot of calories while you're doing it. That's true. However, the adaptations that induce that it induces in the body are remarkable. So what strength training does is it tells your body to get stronger. That's the main adaptation. If you lift weights and you do it in a way to build muscle, you do it in a way to get stronger. And I, I'm saying that because you can lift weights in a way to where it's just cardio with weights. What does that look like? Circuit training, going from exercise to exercise, doing classes with dumbbells. Like that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about traditional strength training. I'm trying to get stronger. I'm trying to be able to lift more weight. I'm trying to be able to do more repetitions. I'm resting in between sets uh, with my workouts. And why that is, is you're sending a signal to the body that it's like, hey, uh, this this uh, meat wagon is going to make me lift these heavy things <laughs> yeah. every week. I better get good at it. And so in I order to get body. good at it, I need more muscle, especially if you progressively overload. You keep slowly increasing more weight and more weight. The body keeps going like, oh shit, we need more muscle. We need more muscle. We need more muscle. And then you hope that the those calories that you're consuming get partitioned over into building more more muscle. And you actually build, you actually teach your body indirectly through gaining strength to burn more calories. Your body at this point, because of the stress of strength training, because when you work out with weights or any workout, right? Any workouts of stress, that's why you adapt. But while you're working out with the weights, your body's like, we need to get stronger. And uh, yes, we're going to burn more calories, but we're willing to sacrifice that because what this person needs or what we need, obviously, is to get stronger. So the side effect, the one of the big side effects of strength training is a faster metabolism. If you look at data where people lift weights and then try to diet to lose weight, the muscle loss is almost zero or, especially in the beginning, you actually see a gain in muscle with the burn in body fat. So if you lose 10 pounds, 10 pounds of body fat versus... The previous example, 10 pounds, four of it was muscle, six of it was body fat. Now, why is this important? Well, the muscle burns more calories. By the way, the, the weight loss, the fat loss, I should say, I don't like to say weight because I, I could cut my arm off and lose weight, right? We want, we're talking about the right kind of weight. 
the the fat loss that happens with strength training looks very it looks and feels very different than the fat loss that occurs with let's say lots of cardio. Cardio looks like this initial weight loss, hard plateau, maybe a little bit more by adding more hard plateau. Eventually it's like, this is too crazy. I can't maintain this. With strength training, it actually, it starts off a lot slower because mm -hmm. it takes a second for the metabolism to kick up. But then you start to notice this kind of snowball effect as the metabolism really starts to kick in. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about just to kind of illustrate this. Let's say you run for an hour. You're, the average person will burn I don't know, 500 calories while doing that run. Some people less. A lot of people think, oh, you know, I could burn a thousand. I mean, not. Most people burn about 500 calories going for a run for about an hour. So 500 calories during that run. And let's say you run, I don't know, four days a week. All right. Do the math. So it's 2000 calories a week that you're burning extra through having to go out and run. Now, could you speed up your metabolism to where it burns an extra 400 calories on its own? Yes. I, 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 we've done this time and time again with clients. Except here's the difference. It's another four to 500 calories a day, every day, seven days a week. So now I'm going 3,500 calories extra a week because it's happened every day and it doesn't require me to go burn them off manually. So it doesn't take a genius to see just how much more sustainable this approach is. Yeah. And there's a lot more to this, by the way. One of my other favorite points to talk about with strength training is what it does to your hormones. This is a big deal that a lot of people really don't realize, and again, this is all backed up uh, by data, your hormones adapt to strength training uh, by organizing themselves to help you build muscle. What does a muscle building hormone profile look like? That's what you want to ask yourself. What does a hormone profile that is organized to build muscle, what does that look like? You know what that looks like? It looks like the hormone profile you had when you were 21 years old. Think about when you built muscle without even working out or when you just got stronger oh, or much whatever. Much easier back then. It's when you're young. It's a youthful hormone profile. Now, in contrast to that, let's say you're exercising in a way that is telling your body to pare muscle down. Your body will organize its hormones in a way to do so. What does a hormone profile that is paring muscle down look like? Not like a youthful one. <laughs> it looks like one you probably don't want. Cortisol is high, growth hormone is depressed, and men, testosterone is lower. In women, we see estrogen or progesterone Oxygen are off. stress. Because if your body's trying to pare muscle down, it's not going to give you a muscle-building hormone profile. Your body's like, I want to lose muscle. We're trying to get better at this activity. Let's create a hormone profile that does that. Versus, again, with strength training, let's create a hormone profile that builds muscle. So, th I mean, just the, by the way, there's a lot, of, a lot of reasons we can get into, but just those two things alone... You can kind of see why, wow, this is like a super effective way to work out. And it doesn't require me to go to the gym every single day. Well, and when we're talking about the the average person, I would say one of the other main points to make is the metabolic flexibility that you create for yourself by strength training versus the cardio example that you gave. Because in reality, not everybody is going to eat neurotic the entire year where you <clears throat> no. weigh and track everything. We're going to have holidays, you're going to have birthdays. And so yeah. when you build a faster metabolism... When you get in that situation where, oh, kind of ate out of balance a little bit this weekend or had some drinks, the uh, uh, amount of that that ends up getting stuck to your body and converting into fat is a much lower percentage when you've built your metabolism up through strength training versus the person that just burns, 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 burns all the time. Those same people are the people that feel like, man, if I eat off my diet just the slightest bit. And it, it just sticks to me. Ever had a client tell you that where they're yeah. like, mm -hmm. man, Adam, I feel like I eat really, really good. But then I just, and that's because their metabolism is so slow that the percentage of a, you know, Snickers bar that's 300 calories is a large percentage of their total ma calorie maintenance. And so if we can get that caloric maintenance up by strength training, then when you have those mishaps, when you have those days where you eat off the diet, 300 calories is a much smaller percentage of your calorie maintenance. Totally. And so you don't put on as much body fat. Totally. And I, and I want to be very clear, all forms of exercise have value. So I don't want to turn this into a like, don't do anything else type mm -hmm. of deal. All I'm saying is uh, if you're being realistic with yourself and you're going to work out two or three days a week consistently because you're not a fitness fanatic, you probably just want to pick the one that's the most effective. And, and most people are not going to do two or three or four different forms of exercise. They don't have the time. They don't want to make the time. They're going to pick one. But just to just to hammer this home 
even more. This is all, by the way, this is all backed up by data, not just our experience, although we experience this time and time again, managing gyms and training clients. But there was this, this just remarkable study. I've brought it up so many times on our podcast. But scientists went and studied a modern hunter-gatherer tribe known as the Hadza tribe. So they live the way humans lived, you know, pre-agricultural revolution, okay? They hunt and they gather. And for all intents and purposes, they are far more active than the average Western couch potato. So uh, just to kind of explain what they do, like gathering requires movement. Even when they sit, they sit actively in a squat. When they hunt, they'll stalk prey, throw something at it. It gets hit. Then they chase it down till it bleeds out or gets exhausted. Then they drag it back. Like they're moving a lot. And so scientists went down and said, we wonder how many calories these tribes people are burning. And they did this really sophisticated testing. And what they found was that the modern Hadza tribes people burned on an individual basis right around the same amount of calories as the average Western couch potato. So John, who drives to work, sits at a desk, comes home, takes you know 3,000 steps a day, watches TV, burns right around the same amount of calories or similar amount of calories to the Hadza tribesman who's hunting and gathering and has no electronics and isn't watching TV and all that stuff. And you think, well, how is that possible? Mm -hmm. Well, here's why. We evolved, our metabolisms evolved Body adapted. to become efficient with that kind of activity because tribes people, lo lots of their activity is this cardio-based type activity. Why is that the case? Because if our bodies allowed us to burn 6,000 calories a day through activity, we would, we would have never survived. Mm -hmm. You know how hard it is to come across energy and calories in nature? So our bodies adapt. Strength training is the reverse of that. It's the form of exercise for the modern lifestyle because the modern person doesn't eat a hunter-gatherer diet, yeah. doesn't move all the time. We have food everywhere. It's super palatable, super accessible. We sit down a lot. So a faster metabolism, that might be a liability for a hunter-gatherer, but a faster metabolism for a modern person is an asset. You want a faster metabolism. It protects you against becoming obese and all of the all the health issues that that come from that. All right, so let's talk about uh, some other of the benefits that you get yeah. with strength training. One of my favorites is it requires less time in the gym because the main adaptation, excuse me, the main benefit of strength training is the adaptation, not the calories burned while you do it. I don't have to keep going to the gym every day to try and burn these calories manually. All I got to do is effectively send this good, effective, muscle building, metabolism boosting signal, and then allow the adaptations to occur. The adaptations don't happen during the workout. They happen after the workout, in between the workouts, during the recovery period. So the average person can very effectively affect muscle building, strength, and metabolism through working out two days a week or three days a week. When the main you know, value of your exercise is calories burned while you do it. When you don't do it, there's no value. You got to do it all the time, which makes it very, very hard to stay consistent. Well, and I want to go back to the point you made earlier. We're not advocating for someone not to do other, like cardiovascular training, not to do yoga, right. not to those things. But if, if I'm setting my my goals with my client for 2023 and we're, we're planning out the year, I want to start by planning for the, the thing that is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck and as little as possible to elicit the most amount of change, which mm -hmm. is that strength training one to two times a week. It's not a lot to get my clients. Going. Now, what I know as a coach that my desired outcome is to eventually introduce some cardio, more walking, yoga, maybe some mobility yeah. work, maybe mm -hmm. some meditation. I mean, that is like, that's where we want to go. But if I'm like, all I got to work with is one to two hours a week, what do I do with this person to start right now changing their body composition in the, in the, in the positive direction faster and better than any other way? Well, that would be strength training now. And then as we build that momentum, then I start to encourage them to start to add the other forms of exercise that will benefit. Yeah, them. the perfect routine includes lots of different forms of exercise. We're just trying to make this as efficient, effective and realistic as possible. For You're the trying to give person. people wins. That's right. it. Because we've been doing this for a long time. We know how important it is 
that you get your client wins and you get them, you make their life easier towards their fat loss goal. Yep. And by building their metabolism, by committing them to less at first and getting them consistent, building behaviors, then you start to add all the bells and whistles and all the other things that are going That's to right. enhance. You know, life. one of my other favorite benefits of, of strength training is it's easier ma to maintain. What do I mean by that? Mm -hmm. If you look at all the adaptations that you can get from exercise, like stamina, flexibility, agility, strength. The one that takes the longest to leave your body when you stop exercising is strength. Mm -hmm. Strength actually sticks around. Now, eventually it goes away. So, so that's saying, saying the old man strength comes that's right. Well, it doesn't, eventually it'll go away. Like you stop working out and you'll eventually you'll get weaker. But if you're lifting weights and you're strong and you don't work out for a month and you go back to the gym, you'll probably be able to lift close to what you lifted before. You stop running and you go try and run a month later, you like went, you went yeah. way back, right? You yeah. stop stretching, you lose lots of flexibility. Strength sticks around uh, quite effectively, quite well. So you get away with missing workouts more than you would with other forms of exercise. And then we have the muscle memory part, which yeah. is just crazy. Yeah, it's the most protective thing you can do for your body. I mean, and the, the difference being there's other forms of training and you can build stamina and you can build endurance, you know, through cardiovascular training, but you know, with strength training, you're affecting all the systems. You're actually building. You're building not just muscles uh, that you see in the exterior, but you're also building support and protective qualities around your vital organs. You're you're building and and building strength and support around the bones, the ligaments that help to provide that stability around joints. So, you know, less likelihood of injuries occurring. Um, you're, you're building and, and strengthening the immune system, cognitive uh, abilities with your brain is getting effect to that. So if you just look through all the systems of the body, strength training has a massive impact across the board. Yeah, it's a pro positive tissue form of exercise. It's, 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 it's main adaptation is to add this tissue called muscle, which has all these incredible downstream effects. That's like the main thing that it does. You're talking about all the other organs. Let's talk about the brain for a second. Uh, one of the main contributors to cognitive decline is uh, is, is you know, insulin insensitivity, right? Our, our, as, as our bodies become less sensitive to insulin and we need more and more insulin, as we start to develop glucose intolerance, I mean, Alzheimer's and dementia, some researchers call them type 3 diabetes, okay? Mm -hmm. The most effective way to positively affect your insulin levels and your blood sugar levels is to simply add muscle. They have studies where they have the severely obese, and they have them lose no weight. They don't have them do anything but build a little bit of muscle. And they see significant improvements. Why? One of the storage areas of the body where you store carbohydrates and sugars is muscle. Now, the main area is the liver, but muscles store glycogen as well. They're also very insulin sensitive. So you really develop this insulin sensitive body simply by adding muscle. And it's very brain uh, protective. You want to talk about heart health. People are like, oh, I heard other forms of, of exercise are phenomenal for the heart. Studies show strength training to be as effective as other forms of exercise for heart health, probably because it's easier to stay lean and probably because of those insulin sensitizing effects uh, that we're talking about. So it's really pretty awesome. Earlier, I said muscle memory. I, I want to go back to that because this is pretty awesome. Muscle memory is pretty rad. When you build muscle the first time, it could take a while. When you build it the second, third, and fourth time, it's uh, it comes back really fast. So what I mean by that is if you gained 10 pounds of lean body mass, and let's say it took you a year to do that, and your metabolism is roaring, and you've got this extra 10 pounds of muscle, and you feel tight and sculpted, and then for whatever reason, you stop working out for six months, and you lose all 10 pounds of it, and then you're like, you know what? I'm going to get back into working out, and you go back to lift, you'll gain those 10 pounds in like a month and a half. It comes back so fast. For anybody who's ever experience this when they've broken a bone, you know what I'm talking about? Like if you've ever had your leg or arm in a cast and then you take the cast off and you notice like the muscle is gone, how fast does that muscle come back? Yeah. Super fast. This is an adaptation, evolutionary, protective mechanism in the body. So when you're working out with weights and you're building muscle, not only does it stick around longer, but it comes back faster when you do lose it. This muscle memory is a very, very real thing. And again, there's lots of studies. Uh, it's my talk favorite about thing about getting older. It's my favorite thing about being getting older and having strength trained for two decades now is that 
you know, I think of uh, strength training is like uh, investing at a very young age. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of nice because then you get you after you've if you were consistent early on investing, you can be uh, a little frivolous and and make not the best financial decisions and blow money a little bit more as you get older because you did such a good job investing early. You can get away with more. I think the same thing is with strength training. Like if you do a good job of being consistent and building muscle over years and years and years, when you get older, there is this flexibility that you have that is greater than what it was when I was in my 20s. It's one of my favorite parts about it is that, man, it's so much easier easier for me to to turn my physique around or to get into better shape because of that muscle memory all the all the time under the iron over all those years. So studies actually they've done studies on this and they found that uh you need about and there's different studies but between one fifth to one ninth of the work to keep muscle and strength that it took to build it. Like tell me another form of exercise that lets you do that where you're we're working out a certain amount you cut it down by uh, down to a fifth or a ninth and you keep most or all of whatever you had. That doesn't happen with other forms of exercise. With strength training, that does happen. And it's basically what all this does is it makes it this incredible form of exercise for modern life where you've got a lot of food around you, faster metabolism. We need a faster metabolism. Our life is sedentary, which tends to tell our hormones to take a dump. Mm -hmm. Well, strength training tells our hormones to stay youthful. It, it it improves brain health and insulin sensitivity, like diabetes, insulin insensitivity, glucose issues. Like that's, a na- that's another massive epidemic. And it requires less time. It is true that we're extremely sedentary, but it's also true that we're extremely busy. We actually pack our schedules more now than we ever did before, even though we don't move much. In fact, if you have kids, you know this. Like when I was a kid, we'd just go out and play. Now you want your kids to play, you got to schedule appointments for everything. So our day and our, 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 our appointments follow us on our phones and emails. So you want a form of exercise you don't have to do a lot of, again, to get a a massive return. Okay, so now that we've made the case uh, for strength training, hopefully we've convinced you, okay, this is the form of exercise I want to start. Then you're probably wondering, well, okay, what does it look like? How do I start? Do I just go and, you know, just lift heavy stuff? Well, not necessarily. There are exercises that are way more effective than others. There are different rep ranges, each one of them. Each one of them does different things for you. And then there's an appropriate intensity and an amount of time that you need to work out to give you the best results. And we've covered this in depth on other podcasts, but let's, we should loosely kind of talk to people about, let's start with the best exercises, the best bang for your buck uh, yeah. exercises. Yeah, your big five, you know what I'm saying? Compound yeah. lifts. Yeah, so, so compound lifts are otherwise known as gross motor movements utilize multiple joints in the body and they're big movements rather than like small movements. So like a small movement would be like a curl. Like I'm just mm-hmm. using my elbow. A bigger movement would be like a pull up where I'm, I'm not only bending my elbow, but I'm also bending my shoulders and I'm also lifting, you know, more weight. So some of the best exercises that just give you like the exercises I'm about to list, give you the benefits of like, if you took 10 or 15 other exercises and combine them together. So they just give you a lot for, you know, a few sets versus you'd have to take like five or 10 other exercises and combine them just to equal what they do. And they're the following, but squatting. So squatting movements, they can be done with a barbell or body weight or dumbbells, but squatting, overhead pressing, rowing, bench pressing. Those are kind of the big, the big movements that you want to do. And then you want maybe some rotation in there uh, for balance. Now, of course, there's lots of different strength training exercises. One of the things I love so much about strength training is that it's super individualizable. So you can target sculpt your body if you want to build some areas and shape some areas. And there's lots of exercises for different parts of your body. But those movements right there are the best ones. And you should practice those exercises, or I should say prioritize those exercises in your workouts. Well, part of what makes them the best is because they they build the most total muscle. Yeah. There's like a, there's a there's this argument in our in our space right now amongst uh, the professionals of like, you know, oh, when I'm trying to build just my quads, squats aren't the best. That there's, you know, hack squats or leg extensions target the quads better. But when you are when you are trying to build a metabolism and you're trying to set your you're trying to lay a solid foundation, right? Long term, what we're talking about in this episode the value of doing a compound lifts that it, the amount of muscle you build total on your body is so much more than exercises that target one specific muscle. Yeah, well, muscle. look, I could do three sets of squats, which effectively works the quadriceps, the glutes, and the hamstrings. Or I could do three sets of leg extensions for my quads, three sets of leg curls for my hamstrings, and three sets of donkey kickbacks for my glutes. 
nine sets versus three sets. And I'll argue, by the way, that the three sets of squats is still going to be more effective. Well, I would argue you sets. lay it, you left out a lot of other things. Yeah, that I was going to say core, core stabilizing, yeah, core shoulders, upper, body, yeah. Also yeah. upper back. Like, yeah. yeah, there's absolutely that's and, so. and you got to count that because even though because those are all working, that's right. Even though it's not like a direct hard core exercise, the core is having to work. Therefore, more calories will be burned, more muscle have been built. Like so. The overall, and when you're in, when the when the case we're trying to make is doing the the least amount in the gym to get the most results, and and starting you off in the right direction for the new year, like that's the type of you want to build your routine around those movements. We can talk about adding stuff later on, but the core should be around that. Yes. Now let's talk about rep ranges. Like, well, how many reps should I do? Reps one to like 25 all build muscle. There's value in all these different rep ranges. So then you may wonder, well, which one do I pick? Do all of them. You want to work in all of them. And ideally what you do is you would focus in a range for a certain period of time because different ranges require different uh, mental approach. They feel different. Like if I'm doing sets of four reps, mm -hmm. feels very different on the body, different preparation. It's a totally different workout than when I'm doing sets of you know, 20 reps, right? So ideally what you would do is a few weeks within a certain rep range and then transition to an, another three weeks of a different rep range. This also helps the adaptation process continue to happen because the body does very well at adapting to what you do, meaning once it adapts and it's kind of hard to squeeze out any more results. And one of the easiest ways to get the body to progress again is to move to something different which one of the easiest ways to do that is to move to a different rep range. So you definitely want to phase your workouts with, with rep ranges. That's a real important thing. And then the other one is intensity. Intensity does not need to be this crazy, like I'm crawling out of the gym intensity. Mm -mm. You want to train hard, but don't train to where you're lifting a weight until you can't lift it anymore. You want to train appropriately. Too intense overcomes your body's ability to adapt. Your body just worries about healing. And then what that looks like, by the way, this is how you know that that's happening to you, is you work out real hard, you get really sore, soreness goes away. You work out really hard, you get sore, soreness goes away. Meanwhile, you're not getting stronger. Meanwhile, you're not building muscle. All your body's doing is healing. There's no adaptation happening. If you're picking the right intensity, you know it's working because I'm getting stronger on a relatively consistent basis. I can lift a little more or I feel more stable or I can do another rep every time I work out. That's when you know you're moving in the yeah, right direction. Yeah, and the more honest you are with your abilities going into this, like do you have any real experience doing this before or do you not? Uh, if you don't, it's it's always better. Less is more. And and also to be able to, to maybe increase the amount of reps so you can get the practice in so you really familiarize yourself with these types of movements. Uh, and then you can gradually increase weight and, and lower the reps and kind of experiment with that. If you're a, a, a more experienced lifter, if you haven't gone out of a certain rep range in a long time, you know, this now's the time to shift it up and, and change that so you get a new stimulus so your body responds uh, appropriately to that. But really to, to approach it and and, and do that honestly and, and, and know exactly kind of like where you're starting from. Protein quality doesn't matter. Actually, yes, it does. No, the truth is both are true. What depends on is how much protein you intake. If you take in a high amount of protein, one gram of protein per pound of body weight, the quality of the protein doesn't matter. If your protein intake is below that, then it definitely makes a difference. So if you weren't confused before this podcast start, you are now. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Yeah. No, so studies done on protein. There's a lot of studies done on protein, athletic performance, muscle building. If your protein intake is within what they would consider that optimal range, which is roughly around one gram of protein per pound of body weight in normal weight individuals, then whether it's from plant, egg, whey, animal, like as long as they're complete proteins, doesn't make a difference really. It's going to utilize it all the same. But if it's below that, then it makes a difference. Then if you find, let's say you're eating half that amount of protein or less, well, then animal protein is superior to plant protein. So when I used to train clients, I focused a lot on protein quality because it was almost impossible to get clients to eat, you know, one gram of protein per pound of body weight. But if I was training like a bodybuilder or like a fitness fanatic, I didn't, I didn't care so much about what kind of protein they took in. Now, where does where do amino acid supplementation fit into this? Amino acid, there's a lot of studies on amino acid uh, uh intake, branched amino acids, essential amino acids. And it doesn't make a difference if protein intake is high. Mm -hmm. If protein intake is low, branched chain amino acid intake or essential amino acid intake makes a big difference. So 
if you're one of those people that just eats low protein, supplementing with those things can really make a big difference with recovery. But if your protein intake's high, you're, it's it's literally burning money. So right, we, but I think it, with that in mind, like it, supplementing with protein powders versus amino, I'm just trying to think of the avatar of the person. Is it like the ultra endurance runner that may, you know, benefit more from also supplementing with aminos? Or is it just like I focus on getting protein uh, exclusively and it's going to cover it? Yeah. I, I So when I trained endurance athletes, uh, I would have them take, because one 10 grams of whey protein will have more branched amino acids than, you know, four branched amino acid pills. So I would have them do that. Right. But you know who used to benefit the most from amino acid supplements were my vegans because they had a tough... Now, if I could talk them into taking like a vegan protein, yeah. like if we had Organifi back then with their you know vegan protein that tastes amazing, I would have been like, take Organifi protein. But a lot of them just, it was tough for them to get the right amount of protein. Protein supplements back there were terrible. The vegan sources were terrible. They tasted like garbage. They couldn't take whey because it was animal sourced. Yeah. So I'd have them supplement with essential amino acids or branched amino acids. They would notice a difference, but their intake was slow. You yeah. know. So is this is it still a thing that in some gyms and bodybuilders will still kind of sip on their amino drinks yeah. in between sets and whatnot? Is it like waste? Yeah, yeah that, waste. that's still th especially for that group. Because that group ain't missing their protein intake. No, you know they're right. not. They're not. They're not missing their protein. Now, when I was at, when I was in my early twenties, I used to take uh, branched chain amino acid pills, like six to eight of these things at night, and I used to do it when I, you know, either you know knew for sure or had a feeling I didn't hit my my protein intake. <clears throat> but based off of what you're saying, I would have been far better off, you know, taking a scoop of Organifi Way better protein powder. And mixing it with water real quick and yes. chugging that down, then swallowing the six to eight pills. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I think that's the part where I think people are mistaking the advice that we give. It's not so much that, you know, branched chain amino acids don't work at all. It's just that, well, what they do in comparison to something like a half a scoop of protein powder would do, it's like you're going to get as much, if not more, benefits from that. And if you're using it with that in mind, like, oh, I'm taking these pills because I don't think I got enough protein intake for the day. Okay, well, instead of doing that, go get yourself a scoop of whey protein mixed with water, slam it real quick, and you're going to get more benefits. Yeah, like, Doug, that. maybe you can look up how much leucine is in 10 grams of whey protein or something like that. Like, you're going to get more leucine, isoleucine, yeah. and valine, which are the branched amino acids, in five grams of whey protein than you would from, you know, five pills of branched amino acids. Now that's whey. What about something like Organifi? It's going to have a lower amount of branched amino acids, but still a lot because they're complete proteins, yeah. you know? So you look at 10 grams of protein from plant-based proteins, you're still going to get two or three grams of, of branched amino acids in there, which would be a lot of pills, right? So, yeah. and, and all the other essential amino acids, which also have benefit. And then the non-essential ones, which if your protein intake is not at that optimal rate, like all the amino acids make a difference. So eleven percent of uh, of whey would be leucine. So that's you know that's that's a that's a lot, right? Yeah. So people, yeah, like I I remember one person in particular it was a friend of mine. We would do jujitsu together. He was a vegan, and you know we were talking about this once, and I would tell him about protein, and he goes, "Well, I don't like, you know, all the protein powders that are vegan taste disgusting." You know, he's like one of those guys that just you know people are super fitness fanatics. We tend to like not care about the taste of stuff. But he's like, they're gross. Like, and, and I was, you know, we're talking about his diet and I figured, oh, he's probably only eating like 60 grams of protein a day. He's a 200 and something pound guy. So I said, take branched amino acid pills before and after jujitsu and see if you notice a difference. And he's like, bro, game changer. Now he would have noticed way more of a game changing, you know, uh, effect if he just took the protein powder. Yeah. Protein yeah, powder. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, protein quality, it, it, it mattered to the clients that I trained because getting the, a client to eat one gram of protein per pound of body weight was like, it was so hard. It was so hard to do because it was so satiety producing and people don't realize how hard it is. You know, even 130 grams of protein, uh, you know, for somebody who's 150 pounds, it's a lot of protein. I yeah. guess you could make the case then for somebody who is an athlete. <clears throat> like I, I'm thinking back to when I was playing basketball a lot and lifting weights and struggling to build muscle that I probably would have benefited from taking the branched chain amino acids before and after the workout, knowing that 60% of the time yep. um, I'm only hitting my protein intake. And so sure, 
you know, half the time I'm taking it and it's not really doing anything for me, but at least I'm getting it on the other half of the time when I'm, I'm definitely low. And so there's yep. some, there would be some value there. Cause I guess that's the case, uh, where I see, and this I is also, why a lot of people see value when they supplement with right. it. And I see, and I understand too, the idea of, you know, consistently taking something. So you, you get in the routine and habit. So, okay, good. You hit your protein intake. Yeah. I'm kind of wasting money by just taking these six to eight pills today, but I'm staying in the routine of doing that because I know overall, I tend to miss consistently. And so then there's, there's some, well, what's there. easier, you, you know, you guys trained lots of people like I did, like what's easier getting someone to take, you know, five pills before their workouts or get hit their protein intake targets, five pills. Yeah. 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 So yeah. this is why so many people are like, Oh, I see the studies. That's why on. it's such a big market. That's why it sells. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It works because people don't hit their protein, but if you hit your protein targets, that's a waste, total waste of money. Speaking of nasty stuff this is a bit of an aside to that, but it reminded me of uh, when we used to play in the and one tournaments. This, this is like a long time uh, ago. The very first, you know, three on three tournament. This is where they rolled out the, the first version of power bar. And so they like cut oh, it up yeah. and they're ha handing it out as like samples. And, Dude, that was so disgusting. And it was like a it, it was like a little brick and it was just like tasted like cardboard basically. But like that was like the big hype and everything. It was like apple cinnamon and you know, it was supposed to be like get you protein and get you all these nutrients and everything to to you know fuel your your performance and your gain. And uh I just was remembering like, wow, like this is this is fucking that's awful. gotta be who owns Power Bar? Yeah. Sorry, that that's right gotta be the, the uh the first mainstream Gatorade, maybe energy bar yeah. or the first mainstream. Yeah, that's right. Like, they market it as an energy bar. Yeah. It was yeah. like the first mainstream, like, like meal replacement slash energy bar slash protein. Who bar. owns them, Doug? It looks like post, like the oh, oh, yeah. cereal oh, like post cereal. Oh, cereal? Oh, yeah. They didn't own them originally. They probably oh Nestle. Them. Nestle. <coughs> of course, oh, Nestle. Yeah. There you go. I, so I used to eat power bars, which were mostly carbs and anything like eight grams of protein, if I'm not mistaken, maybe look it up the macros. I wonder if they change them, but. I used to eat Power Bars as a kid because there's still 10 grams of protein. It was a supplement. They do make they actually Power they Bar a makes a 20 now. gram one. They do have a higher one. They still have their original 10 gram ones, I think. Yeah, they were like sweaty. Yeah, they were <laughs> you know, <laughs> sweaty. You know what I'm talking about? They were so oh, gross. The chewy. It was just like, man, they've come so far. Like now you get like Quest bars. Now, okay, it tastes like cake. Okay, that being said though, I I trust <laughs> what's that it's better for you than some of these bars. Like the nutrients are probably actually in there. Yes. Yeah. Like that's I feel like, you know what? It probably had what it said it had in there where a lot of these bars now are like glorified candy bars. Do you want to know totally. what you want candy know? bar with some protein in Bro, it? Bro, I had an aha moment when I was uh I want to say 15 or 16 when I started to learn about macros and stuff like that a little bit on my own. And then there was, uh, I was watching the world's strongest man, Mario, Mario's uh, Pujanowski. I don't know if you guys know who that guy yeah. was. He won a couple tournaments, looked like a bodybuilder. So he didn't look like a strong man, looked like a bodybuilder. And, and they had listed his diet and he ate like, I want to say like five or six Snickers bars a day. <laughs> and I remember being like, he eats all that candy. What the hell? And then I remember like, I got a Snickers bar and I got a power bar yeah. and I it's compared like the them. Same macros, and I was like, yeah. well, it's, it's almost the same. Man, yeah. you got and that. I was like, I'm just eating Snickers. Totally. You, you figured that out. It took me till I was in my twenties. Question about macros, um, specifically about which macro uh, I should, I could, I should focus on cutting out of my diet first when going into a calorie deficit or, or cutting phase. Uh, I've been in a, been in a bulk for, I guess, or, or a, a calorie surplus for about six months now. Um, put on roughly about eight pounds, maybe. Uh, looking to cut about 5% of body fat. Um, get from 15 to 10. Um, I hear a lot of things on the internet. Uh, read a lot of things. Um, I just wanted to, you know, I, I trust you guys and I wanted to see what what your guys' uh, take on um on that, that was any idea where you're at right now as far as your macro breakdown total calories so i'm um i'm about 39 about 3900 uh, calories uh, about 250 on protein um one 120 in fats and about four four fifty ish i think um if i don't have the numbers right in front of me but i think it's about 450 in carbs nice um yeah, that's what I'm saying. And I, I weigh uh, two two oh five. was the last time I weighed in um, uh, Monday. Uh, that that's I mean that's yeah. That's, that's, for me, it feels kind of easy. I cut from carbs. Yeah, your fat is fine. Okay. Uh, I mean, you can cut fat too, but the fat's already 120 at that many calories. Is, is, I wouldn't cut it that. Yeah, much. I wouldn't cut fats too much. You can cut a little bit, but I do it mostly right. from carbs. Here's the thing about carbs: um, they do feel good workouts. They do help contribute to the pump. <laughs> 
They can help contribute to muscle growth, just like all the macros can, but carbohydrates are not essential. So we have the most flexibility with carbohydrates. What that means is you could go zero carbs. I'm not saying that's where you should go, but you could go zero carbs and you would still get all the essentials you need from your food. But Adam asked the right question, which was what, what numbers you're at now. Now, if you told us that you're eating hundred grams of carbs, uh, but your fat was, you know, 200 and something grams, then I'd say we could probably cut from your, your fat, but your fat's okay. 120 grams of fat, a uh, guy your size, that many calories, 450 grams of carbs. Carbs will be easiest to cut. Yeah, you're set up for uh, actually a good good round of carb cycling. So eating okay. four, if you're eating four, 440 grams, um, I would then make my high day 500, and then I would do like a medium day at like three 300, and then a <clears throat> low day or two at like 200 or even 150. And then just cycle like that, okay. and uh, and let the carbohydrate and let pretty much keep everything else the same. Those you know medium and low days will average out to lower calories. Yeah, will average out to lower calories per week. You'll still have that you know that uh, high day that will feel good for those workout days, which I, I would try and time that uh, on days when you're lifting. Right, I wouldn't want to waste having a high carb okay. day and it be an off day. But uh, okay. yeah, I think you're set up perfect for that, and you wouldn't have to do much other than just. Uh, cycling through some carbohydrates for about a month or so. And I think you'd see some some good, I'd take a little bit longer to get 5% down, but I mean, say a month and a half uh, and you should be there. Yep. So my, my plan is, my plan is to go through this deficit for about 12 weeks. Is that a reasonable goal? 5% oh, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, half, th okay. That's less than a half cool. percent a week. That's to perfect. You can be as aggressive as a percent a week. I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. Uh, that's pretty hard. You probably lose a little muscle with that, but I mean, five percent in twelve weeks, you should be able to keep a, a, a decent amount of muscle mass, if not all of it. I, I think in a month's time, you'll see a difference already. I think yeah. you're I, you're in a good place. You have a good amount of calories. You're eating good carbohydrates. Your your proteins balanced. Like you're, it sounds like you're in a, in a really <clears throat> healthy place. How's your uh, training? Are you following any maps programs? No, sir, I'm not. I, and actually, I just I just got an email on the uh, maps um, anabolic advanced, and yeah. I'm really I'm really tooling about um, getting into that. So, um, just been kind of doing my own thing. Um, just kind of being a student of of the nutrition and the the programming part, and just trying to uh, trying to learn my thing as well. Uh, but I'm really giving a hard consideration on the uh, give, anabolic. Give me advanced. a typical give me a typical lifting week. So um, I'm breaking it down into a, a push-pull leg, um, lower body um, day. Um, doing that, push-pull, push-pull, lower body, push-pull, lower body, taking a day off. Um, I'm usually trying to get about uh, 8 to 10, 8 to 11 exercises per workout, uh, splitting it up to about um, three, three exercises, two exercises per per group um, during during that program. Like, you know, like if it's a push day, um, three or four on chest, um, one or two on shoulder, two or three on triceps. Um, and then doing the same thing on the pool in the, in the lower body days. Oh, you're working out six days a week right now? Trying to, yes, sir. Yeah, MAPS Anabolic Advance would be great for you. Mm. That's our newest program. I think this will be the first one we're mm -hmm. giving away. I'll give you, I'll give that to you. You'll love oh, wow. it. Wow, I appreciate that. Yeah, you'll love it. That'll, that'll, that'll put some muscle on you for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I you appreciate it, you guys. You got it, yeah. man. No problem. I um, appreciate everything you guys are, uh, you guys are putting out there. Uh, it's good, solid information. And uh, that's why I, I wanted to come here and ask my question because I knew that information I got from you guys, I get, um, I could, I could trust it. No problem. Awesome. Are those, are those figurines in the back of yours or are you in your kid's room? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm in my, I'm in my office and those are, uh, those are bobbleheads from, um, uh, baseball games, sporting uh, events that I, uh, that I've been to. I'm a, I'm a sports fan, good deal. Uh, specifically the, uh, here in Houston. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's what that is. That's just a little decoration on my wall. No, they're mine. Good shit. Good, shit. <laughs> good deal. I was like, oh, you're in Justin's house. Follow up with yeah. this, Jeff. I actually would <laughs> love to hear. I'd love to hear how you go uh, through the program because you are a perfect candidate for the program and where you're at calorie wise. I think you're in a like, so I can't wait to hear your results. So follow back up with us. Let us know how it goes in the next couple months. Absolutely. Well, thank you guys. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate everything that you guys do. And thank uh, you for, thank you for helping me. You got right, it, man. Right on. I'll, I'll predict this right now. He'll follow maps anabolic advanced. If he doesn't do too aggressive of a cut, I bet you his body weight doesn't change much. He'll drop body fat percentage and gain muscle. Yeah, he yeah. this great place right now. Yep. I mean, where he's at, uh, 
you know, macro and calorie wise, uh, it, I think is, is, and then following a new program like that, I think is yeah, like be, do like a 500 calorie cut max. Yeah. I mean, which keeps them high and his calories are so high anyway. Yeah. I think he'd be totally okay with yeah, that. He's going to be good. All right. You want an easy way to reduce your appetite, improve your stable energy and get your insulin levels to be more stable throughout the day. Check this out. If you just eat a breakfast that's high in protein with some fat, and probably little to no carbohydrates, you'll probably eat less throughout the day, have less cravings, and have more stable energy. It's a simple hack, but start your day that way, and then watch what happens. It actually makes a pretty big difference. Eat your meat. Yeah. You know, I like I like stuff like this because it works with your behaviors rather than it forcing you to follow like some kind of plan. Like yeah. it's like, okay, you're going to eat breakfast anyway. You're going to adhere to that a yeah, lot more eat effectively. Yeah, like, eat like a, you know... a Three eggs scrambled with a little bit of meat with it and some vegetables, and boom, you're done. And then what happens is throughout the day, they find that when people start with a high-protein and fat breakfast- Yeah, your blood sugar is nice and even. Throughout the whole day. Yeah. Even if you eat sugar later on or carbohydrates later on, whatever, had you not had the high-protein breakfast, you would notice these bigger fluctuations. And we know this now with CGM studies, right? So continual glucose monitors- will measure your glucose in real time in response to the foods that you eat. And they found that simply starting your day with protein stabilizes it throughout the day. Now, what behaviors do erratic ups and downs in blood sugar tend to promote? Cravings, irritability, overeating. So if you just start your day that way, it's like one small thing you can do that can improve or at least push your behaviors in the direction of helping you eat healthier and be leaner. So can I add to that hack? Yeah, I think that uh, this starts in the uh, evening with just portioning off like the the dinner meat that you normally have because typically people eat carb heavy breakfast and don't eat cook a meat or whatever, mm -hmm. and because that part is a little time consuming and most of us have a a main course uh, dinner that's centered around some sort of a meat is I would just, and I, we have these little tiny like Tupperware things, is I would Tupperware off like four ounces. And that goes um, with your eggs. Yeah, and then in the morning, all I have to do is crack, you know, two or three eggs, depending on how big of a breakfast you want, with that meat you and just scramble, scramble it. Together. And then we throw a little, sprinkle a little, an ounce of cheese over the top of it. And now you've got this killer scramble and it was super fast and easy. So I, I make breakfast yeah. most mornings for, for Jessica and uh, that's exactly what I do. So um, like the other night, we had uh, ButcherBox Tri-Tip. So um, ButcherBox, company we work with, they deliver like grass-fed meats to your door. And we always get Tri-Tips. It's like my favorite cut from them because they're really versatile. I do the, the cast iron skillet on both sides, put it in the oven really easy. If you season it well, it's really tasty. And so I'll have some left over. And I'll serve her every morning um, two scrambled eggs with cheese and probably two ounces or three ounces of Tri-Tip. And boom, that's your breakfast right there. And I like what you're saying, Adam, because you know what's interesting about breakfast foods? Before the introduction of cereals, okay, breakfast used to be a protein fat meal. Mm -hmm. That's what people used to eat. Yeah. And then the invention of cereals came along, which by the way, some of the first cereals, people Toast. don't know this. People don't know this. The, one of the first cereals uh, invented or marketed was uh, cornflakes. Mm-hmm. Kellogg's, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Wasn't he was <laughs> trying there, to solve like yeah. some kind of um, masturbation problem? <laughs> he advertised it. It I'm prevented serious. masturbation. So I was yes. like, go eat this in the morning. Was go, that go the story? I, heard, I knew it, it was like a true. weird a weird story that yes. went behind it. That it, He was trying, okay, explain how making a cereal prevents oh, I masturbation. I don't think there's anything <laughs> that I can explain. I think it was all he just said that. Yeah, that's how he was I don't know if it, it happened to him. He's like, man, when I eat this, because then he feels tired, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I don't know. I, I have no idea. Doug, uh, you remember that story? I Yeah, I'm looking it up here. Um, I'm trying to fact check it. We have. We have on the show. It before. says mostly false, but again, it's Snopes, so I don't know if I can. No, no, no. Look not. up cornflakes prevents masturbation. Uh, just do that, and then you'll read. But that's the story. But anyway, nonetheless, uh, that's, you know, when breakfast cereals kind of hit the market, they're so convenient. They have a long shelf life. Um, so instead of taking, you know, 20 minutes to cook. Mm-hmm. You just pour something in a bowl, add some milk to it, and now you have, you know, your quote unquote breakfast. And then it lasts a long time. A box of cereal doesn't go bad like other yeah. perishable foods. 
And so breakfast became, and this is the funny thing, by the way, it's funny to me how we have breakfast foods, lunch foods, and dinner foods. Yeah. Um, and that's just a, a, that's a product of marketing, but breakfast foods do tend to be carb heavy. Yeah. They all meals. look like cake now. Yeah. Pancakes, like, uh, like French muffins toast. or little tiny cakes. Waffles. Yeah. Oh, it's true. You Isn't know, it wild too how our, our our cravings and everything have have shifted from that too? Like if you ever if someone's like, oh, I want breakfast right now. If you're like, hey, I've got some chicken and broccoli and rice in the refrigerator. Do you want me? Because you've that associated up? that with dinner. Yeah. People, yeah. What? Ugh. They would act like that's such a big deal not to do it. You know what broke that for me was competing because it was I had that was like what I was eating all day long. So so many times breakfast was dinner. It didn't matter. It was just like I had to hit these macros and it was what I had prepared. Yeah. And most of what I prepared were like Do you guys do you guys remember I, they don't really I don't know if they do this anymore cuz I don't watch too many commercials uh because streaming doesn't do the same, but when we were kids, you know, you watch TV and you had to watch the commercials. And anytime they had a breakfast cereal commercial, at the very end they're always like uh, part Fruit. of a complete breakfast. Yeah. And the picture would be box of cereal, bowl of cereal. Fruit. There'd be like three or four orange slices juice. of toast, a glass of orange juice, yeah. and an orange. Yeah. yeah. It was like 150 grams it's of like carbohydrates. All carbs. <laughs> yeah. Dude, well, I blame, I mean, look at our food pyramid. You yeah. know, like they had this like insane, it was like 60 something percent carb focus. And then it between that and then how they attacked fat back when we grew up, oh. like that's how our whole breakfast, I think, changed because of that on top of the cereal. Eggs got demonized for a long time. Yeah. Eggs got and completely, bacon. De- and bacon got yeah. demonized uh-huh. for butter, got demonized uh-huh. for a long time. And they told you to eat margarine, which is, oh my God, that's so bad for you. Yeah. And eggs are incredibly, eggs are literally nature's multivitamin. They're so nutrient dense, so healthy, especially for children, especially for kids. In fact, the eggs, eggs are packed full of brain healthy nutrients. Like if you want yeah. your kid to grow up and have a healthy brain, you give them eggs. But yeah, it's funny to me how, I, you know what, I know how many tests I probably did poorly on because- oh, I know. You know, you know, I'm like, oh, I got a big test or whatever. I better eat, you know, I better fuel myself. And it was like five pancakes, toast, Dude, juice. Dude, every single uh, sports uh, event, game, whatever, like I would just load up on pancakes, carbs, you know. Uh, no, no, no. It just <laughs> would crash right before I'd get to playing. And it was just, I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, what does that say, Crazy. Doug? So, yes, it seems like it was uh, invented as a food for patients of a sanatorium in which he worked. So this is John Harvey Kellogg. And at its inception, the cereal was functional. It was supposed to be healthy and deliberately bland and also designed to suppress sexual desire. That Okay, okay, that's what it was, Adam. You asked, how the hell is a cereal supposed to prevent? Okay, so so the thought was, yes, the thought was back then that anything stimulating would promote masturbation. So anything with flavor <laughs> or music that was lively or spicy. Bright or, color, just, yeah. So they're like, we're going to make the blandest, like, taste like nothing food. And which is funny because then they turned it into like a breakfast food. They marketed everybody. Yeah. But they literally used to say, this is so bland, you won't want to jerk off So anymore. this is what wow. John Kellogg thought masturbation did. He said, mood swings, bad posture, acne, baldness, <laughs> <Bad> <laughs> stiff joints, <laughs> palpitations, as I mean, well as lying. a taste for he's spicy food. <laughs> Don't, what kind of posture? <laughs> <laughs> Hairy hands, you know, for days. You know this reminds me of, since we went this way. <laughs> Bro, how big uh, of a problem was this in that where he was working? <laughs> when I go into a cut, is it better to do like lower weights uh, with more reps or try to maintain the strength uh, so I don't lose that much muscle. So that's my question. Yes. What's the optimal range? Yes to both. <laughs> uh, it, it, yeah. So it, it, the the same rules apply. Um, that would apply to to when you're in a surplus. Is that you want to cycle through and phase your workouts because your body does get adapted to a specific rep range and it stops becoming uh, or it can start to stop becoming an effective uh, muscle building signal. So in other words, you know, three weeks of five reps. Follow that up with three weeks of 10 reps. Of course, adjust the weight accordingly, right? Um, and then follow that up with three rep, three weeks of 15 reps and then go back to the lower reps. So you want to cycle through and it doesn't matter whether you're cutting or bulking. Now, the only caveat I'll give you is that you really have to deal with the psychological yes. aspect of cutting. You are not going to be able to lift as heavy, even if you don't lose any muscle, just because you have less energy, okay? Because mm-hmm. I'll be weaker uh, when I go on a low calorie diet before I ever lose any muscle at all, just cause I'm just don't have the, the same capacity with energy. So, so keep that in mind, 
don't pay attention so much to the weight that you're lifting because it's probably going to go down. But that's not necessarily, it's, it's somewhat expected, somewhat expected. Mm-hmm. So I, that the part that you touched on with the, the psychological part, that to me is, this is where the answer lies for the individual. Yeah. Because yes, the, the truth is both have value. The idea is to always be phasing out of reps no matter where you're at in your diet cycle or whatever like that. But I do encourage people to, hey, run MAPS Anabolic Phase 1 and run it some one time through with a bulk, run it another time through a cut, do the same thing in Phase 3, try both ways. And the thing that I want you to pay attention to more than anything else is psychologically what happens to you. Because when you when you are when you when you identify as the strong guy and you mm. really like pushing weight and you're in a cut and you're in a phase where you have to lift heavy sometimes that will fuck people up psychologically and then they end up mm-hmm. doing stupid shit where they load the bar too much they end up hurting themselves or they they screw up on their diet cuz they get they get frustrated cuz they're not they're not they're not seeing the strength gains anymore or they're seeing it go down so how you see yourself react psychologically i think is the answer to how you should run during that personally okay mm-hmm. what i have found mm-hmm. is when i when i am in a, especially when i was competing and i was in a hard cut for a long time it is inevitable i almost feel like i'm getting weaker week over week and that could really right. that could really kind of fuck with you mentally to getting weaker and weaker. So that is when I tend to kind of to taper off of doing a lot of my big lifts where I'm trying to push heavy weight and I focus more on the hypertrophy and the pump and slowing down the tempo. And like, so I start, I love to start playing with things like that where the weight doesn't matter as much. Like if all of a sudden I, you guys hear, hear us talk about do like things like, you know, when's the last time you did like a six second negative or, you know, when did you, when have you done like a a pause squat or you do like these isometric type of exercise in there? I like to start to incorporate stuff like that in a cut because then it takes me away from like thinking about, man, last week when I was bench pressing, I was doing 225 and now I can only do 180. Like that kind of, that messes with my head. So I try and switch my programming up to things that are less focused on weight, but still are sending a novel novel stimulus to my body. So, I, so it's sending a signal that I, my body wants to build muscle, even though I know it's not going to because mm-hmm. I'm reducing calories. And really, there's no science to support why I do that or why it's better other than the psychological game that I'm playing with myself. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. So I guess what I'm hearing is that um, you want to maintain a novelty um, through the cut so that the body is still responding to preserving the muscle and maybe not so much like, Oh, I got a, you know, PR during a cut. Um, I mean, if you can, if you can maintain it, but not hurt yourself, that's, that's great. But, uh, I think most important from what I'm hearing is that just keep it novel, um, throughout that cutting process. Correct. What, what builds muscle is best is also what preserves Mm -hmm. muscle best. Now here's one other thing that I want to comment on with the, with the mental piece, people often look at the physiological aspects, what's going to build, what's going to stimulate the most, what's going to, but I, I think you need to consider the mental piece more than anything. Cause if you stop a cut or if you stop your workout or whatever, it's almost always due to something mentally lose motivation, lose commitment. Oh, I don't know if I feel good doing this or, Oh, I, I think I can lift heavier. Why can't I lift as much? So here's another tip. Um, I like to do a lot of body weight type exercises when I'm cutting and here's why. When I do pull-ups, if I lose five pounds on the scale, uh, I'm lifting less weight when I do a pull-up. And so I notice that I'm not, I feel like I get to do the same amount of reps. So it doesn't mess with me as much, right? I like to do body weight dips when I'm in a cut. And I'll use weight around my waist. And it's like, wow, I can, I can lift. I'm on a cut and I'm lifting a heavier dumbbell than I did before. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm 10 pounds lighter too, right? So it, yeah. you got to, cons- and I know talking about it sounds silly, but put yourself in that position and you know, you know what that feels like. So that's the most important thing to consider, I would say. But yeah, what builds muscle the best is what also preserves muscle the best. So consider that. Great. Great. All right. Thanks guys. You awesome. got it, man. Thanks, Richard. Yeah. How long did it take you guys as trainers to realize that the <clears throat> mental piece is the number one most important thing oh, yeah. to focus on with your clients? It's huge. And, and to kind of reiterate, like, that being something I had to consider a lot when you're going through a cut was like, um, for, first of all, you're going to, you're going to lift less. You're going to feel weak. You're not going to, it's not going to be the same experience, yeah. I think. And so going through, I think, and revisiting it with a different mentality towards it was huge for me. So it was like, 
uh, not necessarily avoiding it because also too, that was one of the best ways for me to preserve muscle, which was like, uh, I, I used to take it all on at once. So being an athlete, like if I'm going to cut, I wanted to do the most extreme, like cardiovascular, like crazy circuit or like whatever I could do to like kind of punish my way to get there. <laughs> uh, and so, but I would lose muscle, you know, as I would go through that cutting process and not get to that desired outcome. And so, you know, to train my mind to stay in yeah. those, same lifts, but realize I'm going to be weaker in those lifts was part of the training. I mean, I think so much of this lifelong fitness game that we play as far as like so much of it's psychological. It's 95% of it. So I, I mean, uh, that's why too, I think I get really frustrated sometimes when we, like we had the last caller with like the coach where we're like battling like over like just stupid, like splitting hair difference type of arguments when it's like really you know the big argument is like figuring out how this person ticks and what motivates them and what keeps them going and what discourages them and why do they quit normally and like piecing that all together and i think as an individual who's listening like that's trying to figure this out like that you have to always be factoring that in too yep. it's not just oh this is the best exercise for this or oh, this study says that when you're in a cut you do this and this response it's like well wait a second like it, that only that only applies if you're perfect about following everything to a t which i have yet to meet anybody who's like that yeah, most people impossible. yeah most people are inconsistent most people fall off most people get discouraged and so it's like you got to factor all those things in when you make decisions like this and so i i just learned over time that man when i was cutting because i have this issue with b building muscle and i used to think that my m muscle would fall off my body think about a guy who works so hard to build muscle and then he goes in a cut and then he's seeing his bench press go down every single week like that would, would fuck with me and then i would fall off the diet i go right back to yeah, oh crap gotta yeah, get back in a bulk yeah i go right back in a bulk because Same. because of that yep. so even mm -hmm. if that was the best thing for me to do that bench press because I I've learned that lesson so many times. I know like, you know what, this is a good time for me to do push-ups, you know, mm -hmm. or isometrics or do things that like, I don't have like this arbitrary, like number that I know is like, Oh, I'm strong when I bench press this. Well, I don't have that for body weight push-ups or suspension trainer push-ups yeah. or like weird right. exercises. You like. know what I, you know what I'll say to do to, to I do this even now to this day to help with the psychological piece when I'm cutting, this is when I'm more likely to work out in a tank top. Cause I can see the definition. So I don't worry so much about the weight when I'm bulking sweater, long sleeve shirt, whatever. Cause I don't care. It's just about how much weight I can lift. Yeah. And it was just something I figured out years ago. It's yeah. like, well, okay. If I can see the definition, I'm not as disappointed that just my sweater wife beater. My, yes. That's <laughs> yeah. both best of both. I used, you know, I used to use creatine like this. So this was like creatine in the cut to help. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I would actually not use creatine consistently and I'd save it for the cuts for a show and I would then start to do it. So I'd get a little bit of, you know, the loading of the water yeah. in my muscles. And so I'd get a little fuller look and do the same or thing. Or you could be like me and just always use creatine because who cares? Maximize it all, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Our next caller is Lewis from the Philippines. Lewis, what's happening? How can we help you? Hey, guys. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. good. Great. <laughs> this is awesome, man. So, uh, of course, before I get to my question, I just want to express like how much you guys have really changed my life and how I get to live. Like, obviously, I found you guys for the fitness and for the health, but you know, the lessons I've learned have transcended so much past that. And it's like just a special shout out as well, because you guys talk so much about fatherhood and being a husband. And even for as young as I am, uh, I think that I'm really learning things that I do hope to apply in the future if ever I am lucky enough to become a father as well. So awesome. the rabbit hole I've really jumped into ever since listening to you guys have really been a blessing. So thank you oh, guys. Good man. Good thank man. you. Thank great, you, man. Yeah, a lot more conspiracy theories as well. After listening <laughs> to you guys, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm gonna get to my question. Uh, so, I'm 21 years old, and I'm a graduating engineering student, and I'm about to enter five months of a uh, very heavy review classes for my upcoming licensure exams or board exams. So, to give you guys some perspective on that, uh, these review classes are about five days a week of lectures and uh, practice exams. But beyond that. People generally do study all day, every day for five months straight. And a lot of my upperclassmen have warned me that this kind of becomes your life. Uh, not, no real choice there. And it can be very difficult to balance other things with the workload and amount of topics that's necessary for us. So uh, with this, I've been consistently training for about two years now. And over the past year, I ran anabolic twice and I went on to performance and I actually just ended aesthetics a while ago. And 
Um, my original goal or my original plan rather was to get powerlift because uh, I really just wanted to focus uh, on getting as strong as possible. But now I'm not quite sure if this temporary shift in lifestyle and a whole lot of added stress from the review classes would be complemented by a program so focused on percentages and maxing out for a competition. Uh, but that being said, I'm definitely not looking to compete in anything. I just want to get as strong as possible. But my question is, how should I change my training and nutrition in what's probably going to be the most stressful five months of my life so far? And is it still realistic to focus solely on strength or should I just look to maintain general health for now? What a great, great question. Great question. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very MAPS well. 15, though, for sure. That's it. Yeah. MAPS 15. When, when do you start this period of five months of, of uh, study? When does it start? Uh, January, January 4th. Oh, January 4th. Okay. So up until then you can train like you normally are. Um, but once you get there, maps 15 would be the perfect program for you. You're absolutely right. The, 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 the stress, cause your body, um, yes, there's different kinds of stresses, but they do all accumulate. So mental and emotional stress can definitely accumulate and take away from your body's ability to handle physical stress. And if you throw too much physical stress on your body during that period of time, you're going to suffer uh, both physically and even mentally. So it could actually hurt your ability to do things like study, take tests. You'll notice your sleep will get worse and then it kind of becomes this downward spiral. MAPS 15 would be absolutely perfect because you get to be active every single day. There's still a good strength focus on it. Um, and it's easy to stay consistent and it should not take away from your ability to do uh, what you're doing with your with your studies for, the net, for, for that five month period. Do you have MAPS 15? Uh, no, I do not. Okay, we'll we'll send that to you. And there's two versions of it. The first one is at home. The second one is more advanced, where you use barbells. With your experience, if going to the gym or is not an issue for you, or you have a barbell uh, accessible uh, at home, I would say go with the advanced version, just because uh, of your experience. Now, after that, after you're done with your your study and you can get to more of a normal life, then I would go to Maps Powerlift. But uh, I think you'll be surprised. I think you'll be surprised with Maps 15. You'll probably see some progress with it. At the same time. Yeah, I think that we have we have these periods in our life where, you know, we we tend to shift our energy and focus on on different things, whether that be family, work, yeah. school, lifting. And, you know, you're you're in a period in your life right now where this is like super important. I mean, you're you're setting yourself up for probably what your career is gonna be for the rest of your life. Everybody's telling you that, you know, you pretty much have no life other than the studying for this five month one. There's no reason for you to try and also, you know, kick your ass in the gym during that same period of time. If there was ever a period of time when you say, you know what, this is where I'm going to scale back on that, do what I need to do to maintain because I care about health. I want energy. I want mental clarity. I want to be strong. And so you don't just write it off and say, fuck it, don't do anything and just eat like shit. And because that's that will actually impede on your learning and actually you being productive at your school. So you want it to complement this new area that you're going to be like doubling and tripling down on, which is the school. And so map 15, in my opinion, is perfect for something like that, where, you know, you're going to be heavily focused on the studying part. And then you're just going to get in there, get your little 15 minute workout. And I tell you what, like you still could potentially build and see good yeah. results during that time. Cause you you're could actually move forward. Yeah. yeah. You're actually working with your body instead of against it. Like most people would do in this situation. Yeah. Lewis, I have a, a couple questions for you. Cause I'd like to make some, uh, give you some advice for nutrition and then some additional exercise advice. Have you ever tried, uh, like a ketogenic diet or really low carbohydrate diet to see how it affects you mentally? Uh, no, I've never, I've never done low carb or anything like that. Okay. So for some people, now for some people, this is the opposite. You have a little bit of time though, cause you have till, you know, uh, the beginning of January, see if you can get yourself into ketosis. So go low carbohydrate, no carbohydrates, high fat, high protein, make sure you eat enough sodium. A lot of people make a mistake when they do this cause you lose a lot of water. So make sure you have a decent amount of sodium in your diet and see if you notice improvements in your cognitive function. If you do, that would be the diet that I would recommend during that period of time. Now, I notice improvements in cognitive function. So if I had to go through a five-month period where I'm going to be testing my mental acuity, mm -hmm. my ability to remember things, that kind of stuff, I would do a ketogenic diet. You have some time to experiment. It would probably take you about three, four days to get into ketosis and maybe three, four days to adjust after that. So you're looking at a week or two. And then you'll know like, oh, I feel better or I feel worse and then go back to how you were. Yeah, you if know, anything, it's it's a valuable tool. If you go through that process, you realize it does help with your mental clarity, your sharpness uh, to use that to kind of prep in towards like a 
big test or like, you know, something like that where you're going to need that extra bit of performance cognitively. So, you know, that's just something cool to consider that, uh, you know, we can, ma we can manipulate these things and find out what works best for our body for very specific needs. So I, I, I do, I, I, uh, uh, piggyback on that. Yeah. Sure. Now the other, the other thing I would say with act, with activity is, okay, let's say you follow maps 15 and you're doing 15 to 20 minute workout every single day. Then the rest of the day you're sitting down and you're studying Make sure every 40 minutes or so you stand up and you do about a minute, one minute of activity. So it could be standing squats. It could be band presses. It could be push-ups. It could be a walk. But studies show that interrupting your, your, that long periods of sitting every 40 to 60 minutes or so improves your ability to learn, improves your ability to retain information, and it keeps you sharp. So so again, every 40 minutes or every 60 minutes, stand up, give yourself 60 seconds of something and then sit back down and you'll find that you'll be a lot better. Uh, you'll be able to remember things and be able to do a lot better with your mental tasks. Oh, that's awesome, guys. I'll definitely try and do that. But is, is that something I can just jump right into or is that yeah. something I have to kind of transition to? No, 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 no. You do it now. If you're sitting down for longer than an hour, stand up literally 60 seconds. In fact, I just pulled up a study that I'm going to talk about um, in one of our episodes that showed that this makes a significant imp improvement in a person's ability to retain information. Literally, you stand up and for 60 seconds, it doesn't have to be a hard workout. You just move. So you do 60, you get 60 seconds of stretching or standing squats or some push-ups. You can or walk around the block. You go for a walk and then yep. come right back. Um, that makes a huge difference uh, with your ability to learn and, and retain information. Um, and even creativity, they actually show improved creativity as well. Do you have MAPS 15, by the way? Uh, no, I do not. What about MAPS Powerlift? Uh, no, I don't either. <laughs> All right, I'll send you MAPS 15, okay? After that, after you're done with your five months of study, then I think you can get into MAPS Powerlift. But I'll send you MAPS 15 right now. That's awesome. Thank you guys so much, man. You got Thanks it, man. For Thanks for calling in. Thanks for listening. I, I, got, I have a, a follow-up question, if you guys don't mind. Yeah, sure. All right, so... Um, just some context, like after listening to you guys, I have reverse dieted from eating just above a thousand calories a day to eating around 22 to 2300 calories a day. And I noticed that I've stalled at around this point. And if I go anywhere beyond that, I just see a lot more rapid weight gain, which is not that favorable. Uh, so I was just wondering, uh, is this stall in calories, um, a sign that I'm not building as much muscle or is it just like, uh, this is like a threshold that my body can handle right now. Yeah, it's it's a threshold that your current body with your current level of activity and the current const context of your life can handle. We can't infinitely reverse diet, but your lifestyle, your muscle mass, your hormones, your stress, all those things will affect this. So right now, what you're currently doing, that seems to be the 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 upper limit. Now, if you change your lifestyle, then that'll change. It can go up or down. And by the way, uh, during this time where we're about to go in this, this, you know, five to six month dark phase of learning, I actually wouldn't stress too much about that. I would eat, I would eat to be healthy. I wouldn't really worry about getting lean, trying to build a bunch of muscle. Like you run maps 15, feed yourself accordingly. As far as like when you're hungry, eat, make good choices, hit your protein intake. But I really, this is not the time that I would be kind of manipulating that when you get out of that five to six month phase and go into power lift, then I would try and get you to increase calories and and really get after power. That lift. would be a good time to do that. Yeah. And I'm just taking a guess because of what you what you do. Uh, you might be have like a kind of a sedentary lifestyle. Do you have you ever tracked your steps? Like so, if we get into power lift, I might have you like do walking with power lift. What are you doing a day? Do you know? Uh, yeah, I ever since well, when when I started listening to you guys, I was doing a lot more cardio. Now I'm just focused on really walking. Uh, so I get around, uh, around roughly 7,000 steps a day. Right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Not bad, but I could easily. So what I would do is when I get into power lift, I would actually increase your calories and then like give you step goals. I'd say, okay, Lewis, first phase of power lift. I want you to do uh, 9,000 to 10,000 steps every day. And I'm going to bump your calories 350 to 500 calories every day. And let's see if the extra moving is enough to make sure we don't put on too much body fat. The surplus of calories helps you build muscle. And I'd try and reverse you like that. That was what, but I'd wait till you're done with your five to six month thing. All right. Thank you guys so much again. You, you got right. it, man. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, happy holidays, guys. By yeah, the way. Yeah. You too, man. Same you to too. you. That's awesome. We got caller from around the world. 
you know, when, when it comes to like um, diet for, I guess, mental performance, I mean, I know for me, if I go uh, a lot of vegetables, well-cooked vegetables, high fat, high protein, mm -hmm. low to no carbohydrates, I am absolute sharp. It's fasting is even better than that, unfortunately. But the only problem with fasting, you can't fast for obviously forever. But if I did like a 24-hour fast and then you had me have to do some kind of mental performance task, I'm like... I'm on fire. Yeah. So I've identified that. And, and it's, it's, this is good stuff to know for yourself because your life's going to change. Yeah. And it's really cool when you can change your diet and your training to improve your life. Yeah, you can adjust things to really benefit wherever you are and whatever season of life you're in or whatever the focus is for performance. Because performance can be in all kinds of different directions, even if it's relationships or something. Like, you know, I, I'm I'm focused more on being flexible now because I want to, you know, build and foster a, a relationship with, with more people. And so I'm willing to kind of like include maybe some alcohol where I normally wouldn't or, sure. you know, wh whatever the case is, is, my only point to that is that um, you know that's something that we can adjust and we can fine tune to be appropriate for wherever you are right now in life. All right, I know you liked that episode. If you did, check this one out.